much. That's not necessary. From now on, no clapping as I stand to the podium. Thank you. Thank you, Russell, very much. Good morning, uh, people uh, of First Christian Church of Garland, and welcome to Sunday morning worship. Uh, I thought you would be interested in this little tidbit. In my spare time, I, uh, I will poke around to see what other churches are doing, right? And so I opened up uh, a church called Crossroads, and I looked at their website, and down towards the right-hand corner was a little pop-up window, and it said, um, if you don't go to church, do you still get to heaven? And the article said, well, probably, but not necessarily. <laughs> now, I would like you to think about that happy thought as we gather here on Sunday morning. I understand that's not why you're here this morning, and it's not what gets me out of bed on Sunday morning. Uh, we are here because we know in our hearts uh, what Jesus teaches. It's remembered in the Gospel of Luke that we are beloved sheep of Christ's flock, and God will go out of his way to find us if we've strayed for love's sake. This morning we come, we gather in this place because of, of God's great love for us. So I am glad that you're here this morning. And I'm glad for those of us who are uh, joining us on camera. And I'm glad for those of you who will be joining us after uh, today, later on, on the recording. You are all loved sheep of the flock. Well, Russell Cannon is back. Isn't that great? He's here to reprise some of his great cello playing. And I think his music is so good, I would like him to serenade me while I'm preaching. Um, you have a story to tell about how you have come here this morning. And I believe that God desires to hear it and redeem it. Welcome to this very room, God's house. There is quite enough love for you and me. Sing a new song to our God, songs of celebration, songs of joy. Gather all the melodies together into one great harmony, of praise. Let the music of our hearts become part of God's great song, pulsing through all of creation. Sing a new song to our God. of today we are singing not only because as this song will remind us that God is holy but as he told us in first Peter uh, verse 15 chapter 1 verse 15 that he has called us also to be holy just as God is holy so I pray today that you feel the holiness of God filling your spirit as I lead you in this song Oh 
Hallelujah to the Lord of heaven and earth. Hallelujah to the Lord of heaven and earth. God of wonders beyond our galaxy. You are holy, holy. The universe declares your Pray with me, please. Bounteous God, Lord of heaven and earth, increase our faith this day as we gather as your people. Pour forth your love upon us and shower us with gifts of your spirit. In our turning to you, grace us this hour with your abounding love, joy, peace, and patience. Fill us with kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Strengthened in faith, may we share your spirit of reconciliation with all the world. We pray this in the name of he who came to reconcile the world to himself, Jesus Christ our Lord who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Do you remember back in the day when they, we used to, you would go in and get something they would give you green stamps? Do you remember that? Anybody here remember that? I know I'm aging myself, yes. Well, I'm glad to see some older people out there. Can you hear me? Uh, okay. And um, Well, anyway, so I remember as a kid, this was kind of fun for me. You know, I would, um, I, I would get uh, the little green stamp uh, catalog out and I would see what I could get with all the, all the stamps that my mother would get when she would go to the store and you have to paste them in those little books. You remember that? And if you collected them long enough, you would get these, um, you would get all kinds of little scraps of books and not every book was full. But I remember many times I would take all the different scraps of these books, all the pieces, parts, green stamps books, and I would go down to the Redemption Center. You remember that? You'd turn them in, and they would take all these stamps, and they would give you something. Redemption. That's the key word today. I want you to listen now to this word of God from the Old Testament book of Genesis. Um, I'm going to read a portion of it. Uh, probably down to verse 7. Uh, but we'll fill in the blanks as we go along this morning. Listen now for this word of God. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all those who stood by him, and he cried out, Send everyone away from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers, and he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard it. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is, is my father still alive? But his brothers couldn't answer him. So dismayed were they at his presence. And then Joseph said to his brothers, come closer to me. And they came closer. He said, I'm your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And, and now don't be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here, for God sent me before you to preserve life. 
For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve you for a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. Um, Joseph wept loudly, (laughs) Uh, so loudly that the Egyptians heard what he was doing. You know why he was weeping, don't you? You know, I recall standing with a, um, a family member the day that the word came. And, and, you know, he had known for weeks, maybe months, that this day was coming. And it was a, it was a round-the-clock sort of waiting thing. It was, and he was always so good at keeping his composure. But, but when the moment came and he could feel the, the tears start to well up, he told us, he said, I'd like you to leave me alone for just a moment. I I, I want to collect myself. We could hear him crying through the doors. It was almost like a wailing. You know, years ago, I read Jeffrey Kotler's book on on the language of tears. I was kidded about that in my family. Dad, what are you reading? I'm reading about tears. And, 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 and Kotler says tears mean different things. They, they represent a metaphor for human feeling. He says there's not a person alive who hasn't wondered about the meaning of tears, what they say, and, and, and who we are. But I, I read this morning's Bible story, and I don't think there's any mystery. This is Joseph, Jacob's son. He grew up the favored one whom his father adorned in the long coat. It wasn't multicolored the way Lloyd Webber pictures it. It was a long coat with sleeves to signify that Jacob didn't want his son to go out and work in the fields and hurt his arms. And Joseph's stepbrothers hated him for this. That's why their resentment boiled the day he came prancing into the field to check on them. How are y'all doing out here in the field? They stripped him of that, that stupid coat of his, threw him in a water well. They wanted to kill him, chose not to. Instead, plan B, sold, sold him for a bag of money instead. And then they concocted this elaborate lying scheme to, to, um, to cover what they'd done. <laughs> and it nearly pierced their father's heart, but they had decided long ago that whatever pain dad would feel was worth it to get rid of this guy. He ended up in Egypt, through the years, rose through the ranks, became a member of Pharaoh's executive team. And now, 20 years later, the brothers come to his court asking help. But first, he weeps loudly. You understand why, don't you? You know, sometimes I hear stories like this and I wonder, is it possible? What do you think? Is it possible that some stories are so hard, so so deep, that they cannot be overcome? Years ago in another church, I listened to a, a young woman tell the long story of how her mother had, um, from an early age, had beat her and then left her and then come back to her, left again, so emotionally damaged her that she clenched her fists and her jaw when she talked said, I don't want anything to do with her in my life. Not ever again. I didn't speak, but she read my mind anyway. She said, I suppose you think I should forgive her, don't you? I suppose you think I should get over the the mess that she's made of my life. I said, yes, for your sake, yes. I believe the anger's killing you. Well, I won't, she said. Every time I let her back into my life, she leaves a a trail of destruction. I don't want to ever let her hurt me again. Didn't know what to say. Sometimes I wonder, is, is it ever possible to redeem the damage that's been done to us? Joseph wept loudly because he understood the meaning of this moment that was unfolding before him. They came asking for more food. This is not a story about food. This is not a story even about Joseph. This is a moment where where damaged people are brought to a place where it's possible to see a way forward, some way to salvage all of the brokenness that's gone on before. And it's powerful. I'm your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. You remember that, don't you? 
Don't be distressed or angry with yourselves because you did that. God sent me before you to preserve life. I pondered this story for many times over the years and and this week, and and I thought, well, you know, I I could preach a happy little sermon on reconciliation. All's well, ends well. It's the way it usually ends up in families, you know. We want to kill each other sometimes. But blood runs thick in the end. We're still family, hugs and tears all around, curtain falls, preacher gives a benediction, let's go home. But I think that this ignores the theological elephant in the room. The one that I've heard a lot of good Christians struggle with over the years. It goes something like this. If everything turns out well and fine in the end, does that make all the other stuff okay? Your brothers try to kill you. (laughs) Your father lives a life of grief. You get sold into slavery. You spend time in jail. You get framed for rape. You're almost killed again. And what? All of this is okay because what? look, look how well things turned out. Or worse yet, God subjected Joseph to all this so that they could get him into the right place at the right time so that the family needed help. Is that the lesson we're supposed to learn here? You know, I have sat in plenty of Bible studies and I have listened to thoughtful people who have insisted something like that. What, God needed Judas Judas to betray him so that Jesus could save us? Is that the story? Or Paul... Uh, needed to go kill a few Christians so that he could take a trip down the Damascus Road and see the light. The church, what? The church needed to be persecuted. People needed to be killed and have their heads cut off. What? So that the church could grow? Is that right? Years ago, I knew a a TV anchor in the church that I attended when when I was in college, and at the time, I I wanted to do what he did. So I remember I I walked up to him one Sunday and I said, would you tell me how you got to be an anchor? He said, "Um, oh, Dan, he said, "Um, I don't think you want to hear my story. He said, "Um, there are better ways to get at this than what I did. He said, I'm really just fortunate, he said. And I found out later he'd had two failed marriages drinking problems that still persisted, adultery, health issues, nearly lost his religion, was estranged for a while from his parents. His father was an upstanding elder in the church. I stayed at their home one summer. Their son, despite his eventual success, nearly broke them. Don, would you tell me how you got to be a TV anchor? Truth is, he probably didn't even know himself how that happened. God redeemed Joseph's life. He redeemed his brother's life, but but not the way you think. He didn't give the brothers a second chance and they took it because given their track record, it wouldn't have mattered how many chances they'd had. And Joseph, strong as he was, he didn't live a fabled life because he was so gosh darn good looking and handsome. Something good happened to each of them because God took the painfully broken pieces and made them into something. He didn't cause the bad stuff. He didn't need the bad stuff. God took these flawed people and proved his determination to redeem them despite their lives. It always pains me when I hear somebody tell me that God punishes them so that they can learn a lesson. Have you heard that before? God doesn't need to punish any of us to teach us something. The moments of of pain and suffering in our lives are are most of the time the stuff of our own making. Or, Or if they're not the stuff of our own making, the problem of living in a fallen world where bad things happen to good people, God doesn't hurt us. God takes the hurt and helps us. We're responsible, ultimately, for the choices that we make. God doesn't lead us down paths of temptation any more than the devil does. You choose to go down wrong paths. The good news is that God has power to redeem your life. This good news for for any of us in the church who live in, in this state of fear that the outcome of our lives solely depends on how good we manage to be. And I want to say all of you are good. But that's not going to save you. 
This is one of the great joys of, of having lived a life in ministry. I get a front row seat to God's work. Alone in prayer, when I stand back and I, and I look at the bigger picture, I can, I can see it. People I know and love who have risen above some of the hardest kind of hardship that you could ever imagine. Sickness and loss that's overcome them. New beginnings that, that somehow emerge from fallen places. Churches that survive terrible times of hardship. Forgiveness that happens. But I, frankly, I know the story and I don't know how it happened. And every time I see this happen, I, I, I'm, I'm tempted to admire for how well you've done. I want to be like you. But I know better. <laughs> I know it's not you. It's, it, it's always been God. Will you pray with me? Lord, take all the broken fragments of our lives and make something good of them. Where there is pain, bring the relief of healing. Where there is failure that burns, give us the gratitude of success. Where there is worry so long and great and so deep that it keeps us awake at night, come to us with the gift of your peace that surpasses our wildest imaginings. Where there is fear of failure, give us the confidence that your grace is sufficient despite our limitations. Where there are memories that still haunt, show us a way through forgiveness that we cannot yet imagine. When we grow impatient, show us how to flourish in circumstances we cannot change. Lord, remind us that you are merciful and loving and kind and gracious, always near to sustain us. We fall down sometimes. Pick us up. Take the moments of our lives, the good and the not so good, and make them a story of your saving grace. We pray. In Jesus' name, amen.
We come now to the table of our Lord, and so we signify God's presence within us and among us as we celebrate this Lord's Supper. And we do love this time of communion, don't we? It's a time we feel closer to one another and prayerfully closer to God all through our gathering in the name of Christ. Because it's a time of reconciliation. And indeed, it's a time of redemption. Paul speaks of the power of reconciliation in his second letter to the Corinthians when he says, so if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. Everything new has come. Thus do we come to this table. We may come old and worn, yet we leave this table new and improved. For Paul continues, all this is from God who reconciled to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God is reconciling the world to himself and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ since God is making his appeal through us. It's often said, love isn't love until it's given away. Perhaps it can also be said we are not truly reconciled to God until we share that reconciliation one with the other. Let us pray. Our Creator and our God, bless us this day, we pray. Bless this bread, symbol of the sacrifice of Jesus' broken body, that we might be whole. Bless this cup, symbol of the life force poured out that we might live life and live it abundantly. Bless this congregation as we strive to share your reconciling spirit with the community in which we live. Bless us, each and every one. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For on the night that Jesus last came together with his disciples, he took bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, and he shared it with his disciples, saying, This is my body, which is to be broken for you. Do this, and remember me. Also, after supper, he took the cup, and after blessing it, he shared it with his disciples, saying, This cup is the blood of the new covenant, which is to be poured out for you. Each time you drink it, remember me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you remember the Lord's death until he comes.
spirit sick and sore, Jesus ready stands to save you, full of pity. Thank you. Loved all the music today. Thank you so much. Eric, where are you? Thank you, too. I love your, I always love your energy. You, bring, you leave it all out there on the field, Eric. You know, we love you for that. Um, a couple of things uh, as we uh, draw to a close of today's uh, service together. Remember the school supplies and the sneakers. Um, Brenda, next week is the, is the deadline, right? or we'd like it all by then. And you can bring it uh, next Sunday, I guess, while we're here, or you could call the church office. Uh, Leslie is here Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, 9.30, 1.30. You could call Dale, make arrangements. But now more than ever, we need you to bring your supplies. You know what a tough year uh, this is going to be for so many families and kids. So we can help alleviate some of the frustration and uh, and whatever that's all going to go into this year. 
by the way, Jack Graham, uh, who pastors the great Preston Wood Baptist Church in Plano, uh, he said, the purpose of giving is to teach us to put God first in our lives. <laughs> and then he added this phrase. He said, God doesn't need our money. Instead, he wants what our money represents, our priorities, our passions, and our purposes. Now, as pastor of First Christian Church of Garland, not nearly as big and well-endowed as Preston would, I just want to add, uh, God may not need your money, but we do. <laughs> okay? Uh, still, uh, thank you for the reminder, Pastor Jack. He's right, you know. God desires that we give ourselves in love and trust and gratitude to him Giving of our money is one concrete, tangible way that we do that. So find those offering plates, find a way to give, and give. The Lord blesses you, and so do we. Uh, as we uh, prepare to sing our final song, I do want to give you the invitation. You know, I could look across this room, and I could, I could fill a couple of hours of stories of your life, of how God has worked uh, to redeem broken places in your life. And I'm grateful for all of those ways. That's why we're church, because it doesn't all depend on us. And I, I, I pray, this is my invitation to you, as you leave this place, as you go into the work week or the days remaining, please remember that God is great redeemer, goes out ahead of you, walks alongside you, I invite you to accept and experience that loving God in your life. Shall we stand? Sure. Let's stand. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior. of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending bring from above echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above. Filled with His goodness, lost in His love. This is my story. My song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Why don't you go ahead and sit down for a moment? By the way, I want to answer that question. Uh, is it possible to get into heaven if you don't go to church? Yes, okay, it is, but your pastor will be really happy that you're here. I want you to hear that out there on the camera. All right, um, by the way, um, I, I want to remind you that, you know, we don't do things quite the way we have been doing it over the years. Uh, we still pray here in the church for your needs, um, and so, you know, we're aware throughout the week, Dave and I, of, uh, of needs. Uh, you got a note the other day about Doug Harrison. Um, he's slowly improving. Uh, we got a note last week about um, uh, Mike Whalen who fell and you know it's kind of weak 
So we, and I know many of you all have responded in care to him, and I so appreciate that. Uh, you are such a lovely church for doing that. Uh, God bless you for all the ways you do. I'm sure there are others that we should be mindful of, but those two, and I just want to remind you, you can, I encourage you to keep letting us know uh, as prayer concerns come up, and I will do my best, Dave will do his best to, to respond to those and to send those out so that you can also join us in prayer. So I'm going to send you with a blessing now, and I know you know the words of this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Yeah. can keep rolling. Uh, we do want to give you the opportunity this morning, something Dan and I talked about this week. There are folks at home who have not been able to come and join us yet, and they are missing seeing your faces. So I just want to say to all those out there that I have met and I have not met, we are glad that you are here with us, and hello. And I want to invite anybody else who wants to come up and wave at somebody and say hi. I had a wonderful visit with the Waylands this week, and I just want to say hi to Kim and Mike and anyone else that I have missed seeing. Uh, so take some time. Uh, we're still taping, so take some time to come up and wave hi to somebody. Thank you. 
careful. Russell, please come back again. I'll be back. I love, I love your thank you, Jerry, for so effortlessly accompanying him. Sam, thank you. Good music. Hey, did we ever get the money thing figured out? I think so. You're in the email kind of. That's all she needs. Just do it. I mean, really, don't worry. $54.